Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome to our third celebrity lecture series. As part of the endeavor of the Western Museum of Flight to preserve living history, we are privileged to have with us today two gentlemen who played a significant role in aircraft development and technology. And they have graciously agreed to share their experiences with us today. We have Don Spalding and Ray Ulyate. 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 <laughs> and I've been saying Ulati all this time. I know. <laughs> All right, Ray. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it, even though a lot of you are my relatives, <laughs> uh, grandkids and in-laws and sons and daughters. And it's fun to be here. I really enjoy it. I'm here to talk about Edmund Rufus Doak, aviation pioneer and founder of Doak Aircraft Company of Torrance, California. I want to talk about the history of aviation in the nation and primarily in Southern California. First of all, Ed was born in 1898. He was raised on a ranch in Texas near Fort Worth. His father was a livestock dealer or trader. His father fell in ill health and they made the decision in about 1910 to move to Southern California where he felt he could get better medical care. So the Doak family packed up and moved to Los Angeles. Shortly after they arrived, Doak, Mr. Doak Sr. passed away. Now Ed was 12 years old at this time, and he needed to go out and earn a living for his family. So he dropped out of school, he got a permission, got a per work permit, and he found a job uh, a Pacific Hardware and Steel Company. And he went to night school three nights a week at L.A. Poly to continue his ed education. Well, in 1910, before the Dokes came to California, a s major event took place in Southern California, which was the, the air meet at, at Dominguez Hills, which really brought aviation to Southern California for the first time and that sparked a lot of interest in people. Well, it was repeated again in 1911 and in 1912. Well, in 1911, Ed Doak pedaled his, he was like 13 years old, and he pedaled his bike from Los Angeles to the Dominguez Hills and attended the meet. And he was very impressed with what he saw, needless to say. Now, we'll go to slide two, and we'll back up a little bit. There's a picture of one of the founders of aviation in Southern California by the name of Martin. Glenn Martin. Glenn Martin built his first airplane in 1909. He was 22 years old and had a Ford dealership in Santa Ana. And he and one of his mechanics built this airplane. Well, it wasn't exactly this airplane because the first airplane they bid crashed built the crash. But the next one worked. And he was at the, at the flu at 1910 and in 1911. Okay, so that kind of got Ed Doak excited about aviation. 1913, uh, Glenn Martin formed Martin, Glenn L. Martin Aviation and moved to Los Angeles, and very close to where Ed Doak worked. And Ed Dork, Doak went up, and as a 13-year-old, or 15-year-old, he was hired as a stock boy by Glenn Martin. Martin received a contract from the Army Signal Corps to build 17 of the Martin TT trainer, TT standing for tractor trainer. Most of the airplanes around from 1903 to 1910 were pushers. This was the first commercial or first production model of a tractor or with a propeller on the front. Um, Ed had his job. They hired uh, Ed Martin in another year or so, hired a, a new chief engineer right out of 
school with an aeronautical engineering degree by the name of Donald Douglas. And then his shop manager was a guy named Lawrence Bell. And remember these names, you probably heard them before in the aviation industry. In 1916, Wright and Martin, the Wright Company and the Martin Company formed a joint venture called the Wright Martin Company. And uh, for some reason, to build engines of all things, because the Wright Company also owned Simplex Motors, and Simplex had a license to build Hispano Suiza engines, which were the best engines going at that time. Anyway, that, that, that was a great deal, but about a year later, Glenn Martin had enough of Wright and the Wrights, and uh, he left the Martin Company. Or, or, or he left the Wright Martin Company. In the meantime, Don Douglas went on to uh, work for the Army, the Signal Corps, as their, their engineer. And uh, 1917, Martin left to form the Glenn L. Martin Company. Ed, ser Ed uh, served as a civilian in, during World War I. Ed served as an inspector of engines and aircraft for Signal for this, the uh, Army Signal Corps in Sacramento. Martin Company moved to Cleveland with uh, Don Douglas again hired as a manager, general manager. Um, in the meantime, after the war, Ed returned to LA as manager of a non-ferrous metals foundry out of the airplane business. But close to where he worked, there was Don Douglas and the Douglas Davis Company building airplanes, so he got it interested again. He would run, or, Doug would run around the corner to a loft where Douglas was building his airplanes. It was a plane, the Douglas Cloudster, which was built to fly nonstop across the nation. Uh, it made it as far as El Paso when the engine quit. And that was basically the end of the Davis Douglas Company. But in 1922, Douglas reformed Douglas, Douglas Aircraft Company, moved to Santa Monica, and got a contract from the Navy to build torpedo planes, and hired Ed Doak as purchasing agent. So now Ed's in the business. In 1923, Douglas got the job to build the from the Army to build the World Cruisers, the Douglas World Cruisers, which were very famous airplanes at that time because they embarked on a round-the-world flight, which took a long time. And I think only two of the, of the four airplanes made it. But it was a good airplane, good experience. And Dope Dead was really proud of the fact that he bought all the material for those World Cruisers when he was working for Douglas. Now, in the meantime, while he's working for Douglas, he's got another project. This is a little airplane that uh, Ed Doak and his, his buddy who worked, worked for Lockheed, actually, uh, Woody Deeds, designed and built this little airplane, the Doak Deeds um, Sportsman, they called it. And they did it at nights and weekends. It was like a home-built project, but nobody, well, all the airplanes were home-built <laughs> except for very few at that time. Doak is on the left and Woody Deeds is on the right. In 1932, Don Douglas and Jack Northrop got together and they formed Northrop Corporation in El Segundo with the idea of, of, using, Doug, of using Jack Northrop's te techniques for designing and building Navy airplanes. And uh, that went along until, oh, 1938, Jack Northrop and Ed Douglas and uh, Don Douglas split up Northrop went over and formed Northrop Aircraft Corporation. Took the money he got from Douglas buying him out. And the, uh, the uh, Northrop plant in El Segundo became the El Segundo division of Douglas Aircraft. That time, Ed Doak was made general manager of Douglas El Segundo. And one plane that Ed Doak loved, and I remember seeing pictures of this airplane in his office, was a Douglas DC-5. That was the only Douglas DC airplane that was not built in Santa Monica. 
It was built in El Segundo. It was a pretty good little airplane, but it came out at the wrong time. Now, Ted Heinemann was involved in the design of it, as with a guy named Ted Smith. Now, below it, I have a picture of the Aero Commander, the Ted Smith designed Aero Commander, which turns out to be a 5.8 scale of a DC-5. And it has the 15 degree dihedral in the horizontal stabilizer, which you will see is common with all airplanes that <laughs> Doug was involved with. Uh, that was to solve a problem on the DC-5 of, of uh, turbulence from the engine. 39, as, a, as a, the war in Europe got going, Ed decided to form his own company. He, he decided he needed to go out on his own. So he formed Doak Aircraft Company, Torrance, California, 1939. The primary purpose was to build the Doak DRD trainer. This is a nice airplane, but as many airplanes, it was all wood, incidentally, because aluminum was in short supply in 39 and 40. So they, uh, as most airplanes have them, it was overweight and underpowered. And the Army decided that they didn't really need another trainer. There were a couple pretty good trainers already in the line, and, and they would rather have Doak do other things. And one of the things he did was build wooden fuselage skins for North American and for Vol-T. And I'm assuming it was for the AT-6 and the Vol-T PT-13. How many they actually put on airplanes, I don't know. I've certainly never seen it on those airplanes with wooden skins. At any rate, that was his start. And then he moved into about a 12,000 square foot building on Abalone. It was an old uh, glass factory. And they'd been using it for storing cars. And uh, that was the beginning of his uh, war work, which later expanded into building aluminum parts for virtually everything that flew. And gun turrets, bomb bay doors, hatches, just all kinds of pieces. And there's the factory as it looked in, on Abalone in Torrance in 1944. Peak employment, feeling he was running seven days a week, three shifts, was over four, or almost 4,000 people. And Ed said, he says, I hired half of the women in Torrance. And I think maybe it was more than half <laughs> at that time. Uh, he had a total of 125,000 square feet in these various plants, and did pretty well during the war. At the end of the war, and I don't, I can't confirm this. I tried to, but I remember hearing when I worked for the company that they were had just signed a contract or ready to sign a contract to produce Ryan FR1 Fireball airplanes, and that, of course, was canceled, as, as most defense contracts were at the end of the war. Next slide. There were the two plants, the main plant, uh, the plant that I worked in on uh, 223rd and Western, and above is the Abalone plant, which was used during the Korean War period to build um, various airplane parts. The main thing that I remember was building uh, pylons for external fuel tanks, external stores for, for a variety of airplanes. But during this period of time is when Ed started really going after his quest for vertical flight. And he played with a lot of things. And he had an excellent craftsman work for him. Uh, Stacy Maxwell, was a, who ran his shop, but he was, a, he was an artist with materials. If you've noticed, if you've seen the, the uh, what looks like washing machine agitator sculpture in front of the operations building next door, you'll see a sample of uh, Stacy's work. It's just magnificent. At any rate, he was... He was doing that thing, and he came up with a lot of ideas. He, he, he got a lot of patents, and there's a couple of them. One of them, the one on the left, is 1954, was it, uh, filed, and the one on the right was it, for a flying saucer, was in 1950. In the corner over here, there's a, there's a scale model, or a working wind tunnel model, of that machine. I think it was a Doak 11. Now, anyway, he did a lot of things like that. After the Korean War was over, in about 40, 55 or 56, the Army, Department of the Army issued experimental contracts for different types of aircraft that might combine vertical takeoff and forward flight capabilities. 
Doak received a contract for the ducted fan configuration of aircraft. There's the uh, counter-rotating rotors. I hate to say it, but it looks like a really high-tech washing machine <laughs> adjective. <laughs> So it's a work of art, no question. <laughs> okay, one thing that happened that made a lot of this vertical takeoff um, airplane possible was a new engine. Lycoming came up with the, the T-53 engine, put out at that time 825 shaft horsepower and uh, weighed only 480 pounds. So it had pretty good power to weight ratio. And that allowed a lot more flexibility. The other thing is, is it had real low vibration. It was a turbine engine and uh, made a nice, sweet thing. So anyway, Doak got a contract to build this airplane. It was a, a technology demonstrator, basically, a research airplane to see if it could work. And there we are in the shop. I think at this time we're, uh, we were doing static testing of the wing. Got a little different situation when you got the, all the lift at the end of the wing. Normally in airplanes, the wing is, lift is, just, excuse me, lift is distributed across the wing. In this case, it was all at the wingtip, so we had to do some serious testing, and that's a serious piece of wing there. And all the load was carried by the, from the quarter cord forward. Uh, we had to accommodate drive shaft down the back side of the quarter cord. At any rate, there you see the duct, and uh, this is uh, it, basically we're putting the pieces of the airplane together. And... Uh, and there we're putting it on the truck. That's me. I was a few pounds lighter in those days. And standing next to Ed Doak, who uh, always wore a hat and smoked a cigar. If you didn't have a hat and a cigar, you didn't recognize it. Anyway, there's the airplane on the truck. We're going to take it to the airport, Torrance Airport, right down the road here, uh, where the Robinson helicopter plant is, one of their plants is. And uh, we decided, and we were going to do some testing. And basically, that was the configuration of the airplane as we brought it to the airport. And uh, in the front cockpit was uh, Eddie Dietrich, who was an old timer, a good friend of Ed's, who had a flying school, flying service here in Torrance. In the back seat is Jimmy Reichert. And Jimmy was, is a, was a brilliant guy. He was a combat Marine in, uh, at Iwo Jima. He had, still had shrapnel in him. I uh, got a degree in, from Caltech in engineering, and he was a brilliant aerodynamicist and, and a private pilot. He had his own airplane. He's just a good guy. Well, the first thing after we, you know, made sure nothing serious would fall off the airplane, we uh, tethered it. That was about as high, and that was Eddie Dietrich, and that's the last time he flew that airplane. He just couldn't. He just didn't feel he was up to it. Now, there's the crew. This is... On the, on the right, on your left, is Ed Doak. And in the cockpit is Jimmy Reichert. Next is Stacy Maxwell. Norm Nelson. The one on the far right is Norm Nelson, exactly. More, more about Norm later. Well, we ran tests. We found out things that, we, that, that, were, that worked, found out things that didn't work. Uh, I got involved in redesigning the duct actuating mechanism because it had too much slop in it, so I did that. We had to put, we ran taxi tests on on the runway. We couldn't lift it off. That was a, would have been against the CAA regulations. But we were concerned about downwash over the tail at various angles of the duct. So we pasted uh, pieces of yarn and uh, shot pictures of the the, the flow of the air and decided we needed a variable instant stabilizer. Well, I did, I did that. That was one of my projects. But we, when we review, reviewed the films, of the tuft films, and there was quite a few, few feet of it, uh, Norm Nelson says, I think they're going this way. And I said, I think they're going this way. And so we had an impasse. So we called in the engineering secretary, Sally. <laughs> Sally, which way are those going? She says, they're going this way. Okay. <laughs> and it was a good thing. It was, it was, it was the right answer, and we, we took care of it. We put 10 degrees of, of uh, horizontal pitch, pitch in it, and uh, that made a big difference. 
What's that? She was good. She was good. I, that's, that's been throughout the aviation industry, yeah. too. That, we all know that. There's the airplane. Oh, well, I, f I forgot to mention. The, the Army was kind of happy, and they, and they said, well, they may made a proposal. Well, let's put skin on the airplane, make an airplane out of it. So we got another contract, and I don't really know all the dollar numbers. I think the total contract value of everything we did, including running 50 hours of flight test, was under a million dollars. Pretty good bargain. At any rate, I brought that picture up for two reasons. One, I wanted you to see what the airplane looked like. And the other was I want you to look at the oral derricks back there that we used to have, we used to have around this area. And also, you can see snow-capped mountains in the background. No, pretty nice. There's the ducted fan. One of the things we written when the original design of the ducts, we had a f they're fixed pitch fans. They're eight bladed fans, and four foot diameter. And in order to hover and have lateral control, you had to have differential thrust. With fixed pitch props, we did it with veins in front of the blades. Though so by twisting the veins, we could either increase or decrease the thrust to give us roll control. Well, the first set we had seven veins, and that was a not satisfactory. We couldn't generate enough differential thrust, so we back to the shop and we doubled the number to, to 14 veins. And that's the 14 vein configuration. One thing I didn't mention yet was noise. Now, one thing that I regret is that I don't know if a sound recording was ever made of this airplane. But basically what this airplane consisted of, is from a noise standpoint, was two 400 horsepower air raid sirens. <laughs> and we'd fire that thing up and the phone would start ringing at the police department, <laughs> Doak aircraft. Nobody liked the sound of it. The dogs would wail, you know. And it, was, it, was, it was soon after that that we finished all our tests here at Torrance. And we took it back to the factory and did a little bit of more fixing and as you do on any airplane. And then we put it on a truck. And uh, in 1958, we took it to Edwards. And uh, personally, uh, I had found that after we completed the engine, and they looked at my resume, and I was the only engineer in the company that had ever run a gas turbine engine. And that was while I was in the Air Force, and I fired up a J-33 once. <laughs> so they said, well, somebody's got to learn about the engine. You go back to Lycoming. So I went back, spent a couple of weeks at Lycoming, and learned about the engine. When I came back, uh, since I was the expert on the engine and knew how to start it, they, they said, okay, you, you, know, you kind of run the ground tests. And we, we got all through that. And then they said, well, it's time to go to Edwards. So basically they gave me a copy of Flight Test for Dummies. And uh, another engineer, Mark Brislon, and I and a couple of mechanics and a pilot, and we went to Edwards. And that was an experience. Let's see where we are. We did, basically, we had a whole list of things to do. We did it. The Air Force supplied chase for us. We had two chase pilots, depending on whether we were going to do real slow work or, or a higher speed work. The first chase, one chase airplane was, a, or the chase helicopter was an H-21 flying banana. And for fixed wing chase, we had a T-28. Pilot of the T-28 was an instructor in the test pilot school because they had the T-28. And the uh, helicopter pilot was an Air Force helicopter test pilot with, I don't know, 6,000 hours in helicopters at the time. Um, the Air Force pilot, the uh, T-28 pilot, scared us to death. And he could fly that airplane slower than that damn helicopter. I mean, it was scary. His name was Tom Stafford, who became an astronaut. He commanded uh, Apollo 10 and did the joint Russian other thing, and ended up as a major, as a lieutenant general, as commander of Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, unfortunately, um, the helicopter pilot. And let me see if I can get to the right slide here. 
You know, the slide will come up a little later. They had an arm, arm, uh, open house, a typical Edwards open house in 1959. And we had our airplane on display as, as uh, Vertol had their tilt wing and, and uh, Bell had their tilt rotor airplane. So we, we were all on display. And, um, um, our helicopter test pilot demonstrated a little French gin helicopter. And he made a long pass down the ramp, jump takeoff down the ramp, pulled up to go around, and the thing came down, and that was it. And we lost our, ch our chase pilot. And that was the only, that was a major disaster for our, for our program, personally. Because he was a really nice guy. Um, we, in the course of our 50-hour program, uh, lost one engine. We had foreign object injection. The screw came loose and went through the compressor. And on takeoff, of course, and uh, but it was not a problem. He was able to go around and make a conventional landing. There's the controls in the tail of the airplane for pitch and yaw and hover, and the, of course the turbine engine had an exhaust stream of about 100 pounds of thrust at full power. And most of the time we flew this airplane, it was a full power because the airplane was heavy and the engine didn't put out enough horsepower. We were a little limited, and density altitude was a problem at Edwards because of its elevation. We solved some of that problem by flying really early in the morning when it was cold and get the density altitude as low as we could. Anyway, th those were another modification and my friend Mark, the other flight test engineer, had designed this articulated veins that increased the amount of pitch, pitch thrust we had and, and uh, we didn't need it for yaw, yaw was okay. I don't know if you can see the smiles on everybody's face. This picture was made on the 5th of May, 1959, when we did our first complete uh, takeoff, conversion to forward flight, cruise, conversion to vertical flight, and landing, all in one sequence. In the white shirt is, is Ernie, and in the cockpit with a big grin is Jimmy and the mechanic, Tommy Robbins above, and of course, Norm Nelson, and in the back with his hat is Ed Doak. It's a really happy day. It's something we would really worked hard for. And as you will see, you, uh, on the video I'll run, you'll see that happening. We uh, needed to do some testing at sea level, and then the Army would like to, liked us to take the airplane to uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and demonstrate it. So we ferried the airplane from Edwards to Oxnard Air Force Base with one stop in Palmdale for fuel. We had a very limited fuel supply. <laughs> and it was not a very efficient airplane. But, no. A 3,000 pound airplane with 825 horsepower it should have done better than it. But it was a limitation caused by, by our fixed pitch fans. We couldn't adjust the pitch, couldn't get good thrust at higher speed. At any rate, so while we're at Oxnard, we put on a kind of a dog and pony show. We put on an exhibition and uh, demonstrated it for the Army, and they had an uh, Army acceptance ceremony where the Army accepted the airplane. And after that was over, we took the airplane apart, put it in a C-130, flew it to Andrews Air Force Base, put it together in a hangar at Andrews, and then flew it over to Fort Belvoir. And we put on the demonstration in conjunction with the American Helicopter Society meeting. After that was over, we ferried it down to Southern Virginia to uh, um, Fort Eustis, or I used to call it Fort Useless, Virginia, <laughs> which is where the contract for the airplane came from the Army Transportation Command that was headquartered. So we went down there and we put on an aerial demonstration at that point. That worked out good, those were fun. Okay, now I'd like to go to the next slide, and this is the open house at Edwards. If you can see on the left is the, the Bell XV-3, which was really the prototype for the, the Osprey that was flying today, and that was 50 years ago. There's nothing really new in, in, in airplane business. Then our airplane, and on the right, uh, a little farther down, you can just see the, the canopy and the engine sticking up from the... Uh, Vertol vertical takeoff airplane. 
once the, we completed all these things, we put, the, I mean, we completed the demonstrations, we took the airplane apart again, flew it in a C-130 to Torrance Airport. And we put C-130 in here and unloaded the airplane and did some finishing things, added a more, few more modifications the Army wanted. And took it back to Edwards, did the final tests, and then turned it over to NASA. By this time, NASA, it was NACA when we first went up there, but NASA, then uh, we took it, they took it apart, flew it back to, to Langley in Virginia, and they flew the airplane for a few years, I don't know, put another 100 hours on it maybe, and then put it in a museum. Now there were four airplanes at the time that were in basically the same program, exploring different philosophies or different ways to do vertical takeoff. The Ryan VZ-2 uses what they called a deflective or deflective uh, slipstream of big propellers and huge flaps that came down and directed thrust. We referred to it as defective slipstream. <laughs> they didn't appreciate that. And we also called it the Reynolds Wrap Special because it was a really lightweight airplane. Uh, above it is the Vertol VZ-2, which was a tilt wing. It was okay. Actually, we shared a hangar with those folks. And uh, sometimes they would go back and leave the airplane and take off and go back and re-engineer something. And when we had our engine problem, it was very close to the end of our program. We didn't have a spare. But I looked across the hangar and there was an engine can. And I said to Ernie, the crew chief, I said, Ernie, why don't you go over there and see if there's an engine in that can. And sure enough, there was a fresh engine in there. I said, I think what you should do is you should take the engine out of that can and put it in that airplane, <laughs> which we did. We didn't tell anybody about it until, until later. Right. And uh, about the time, I think about a month later that I completed writing the final flight test report, I handed it in and I got my last paycheck and I was out of the airplane business. That, let the Army and the Air Force argue that over. I never heard anything more about it. And the one on the left is the Fairchild DZ-5, and its whole career consisted of that flight. And it got it two feet off the ground, and they decided that wasn't a very good idea <laughs> with tethers on it. You know, while things are going on, and some new models were worked on, and I thank Don Spaulding for dragging these pictures out. Uh, a transport version, two-holer, a four-holer. And I gotta believe this was a disappointment to Ed Doak because he really loved this airplane. And there was a competition and Bell Aircraft won the contract for the, a four-holer. A little different configuration, but basically a ducted fan on each corner. And uh, they built two of them and don't got nothing. Now, I want to talk about Norm Nelson. Norm Nelson was my boss. He's the guy that hired me. Uh, my first boss in the aviation business. And uh, we never talked that much. He would basically say, this is the problem, fix it. And if you can't fix it, come see me. And that was it. I mean, it was just wonderful, wonderful guy to work for. Well, after Doak closed in, in uh, 1960, 61, uh, closed up shop, laid everybody off, and a, a group, three or four guys, with, along with the drawings and, and uh, data, went to Douglas. Douglas bought basically the rights to the Doak airplane, and they subsequently made proposals for fixing a lot of the things, including using more horsepower. That 825 horsepower T-53 engine we had ultimately puts out 1,400 horsepower. We could have used that, I can tell you that for sure. At any rate, so uh, I, didn't, uh, you know, I got off in, the, in another career area in automotive. And uh, sometime in about 1962, I get a phone call from Norm Nelson. Hi, Ray, how are you? I said, gee, Norm, good to hear from you. What, uh, what's going on? He says, well, I was talking to a couple of guys, and he says, your name came up. And, oh, God, what did I do? He said, no, no, no. 
And he says, we're looking for somebody in flight tests, and, and uh, we could really use you. And I said, well, gee, that's awfully nice, Norm. I, I, but I'm really committed to what I'm doing. But, but tell me about it. He says, I just did. <laughs> okay. So like 25 years go by. I'm in the library, I think at the Air Force Museum in Dayton. And I'm looking at this book. And they start talking about the A-12. And they talk about this guy, Norm Nelson, working for the CIA. Wow. Now, it couldn't be the guy I know. <laughs> then I saw this picture, and I said, son of a gun, it is the same guy. Norm was hired by the Central Intelligence Agency to ride herd on the A-12, which was dragging. The A-12, in case you don't know, is, was the forerunner of the SR-71, basically the one below the Doak airplane. And his job was to, to go in and ride herd on, on Lockheed and on uh, Kelly Johnson. Well, nobody could talk to Kelly Johnson from the military. Ed could be, I mean, uh, Norm could because he had a relationship established over many years, and they were a pretty good, at least working relationship. But he went into Lockheed, and I guess had a meeting with, with uh, Johnson, and Johnson says, well, Norm, welcome aboard. Here's the deal, you don't get a secretary, you don't get an office, you don't get a desk, and you don't get a telephone. But you're welcome to a pencil and paper, and you can talk to anybody on the project, but you cannot tell anybody anything from this building. So he would handwrite his little reports and go to a telephone booth on, on San Fernando Road and report into Washington on what was going on. Uh, the one thing, I, I did have lunch with the Norm after, after that program, maybe 25 or 30 years later. And he says, yeah, I, says, I read that in the book, is that true? He says, yeah, sure is. Uh, he said, the only thing, he says, I really contributed to the airplane. He says, the airplane was finished, but the engines weren't. And they had a lot of trouble with those J28, J58 engines. So he said, well, why don't you put a couple of J75s in there and at least get some flying done, and we can work on the handling and you know, the low-speed stuff before the big engines come. So they did that. So the, one of the airplanes in there put the J-75s in. They got the program going. Okay, well that program finally matured and uh, Norm moved on to the next program, which was a McCulloch. And he and Jimmy Reichert and a couple of the other Doak engineers went to work for McCulloch and they came up with the little J-2 autogyro, which wasn't a very good airplane, unfortunately. And I think they built a dozen of them maybe and uh, was not a success in the marketplace. In the meantime, going down one more, there's a ship there. Norm gets tasked to go to Hughes and ride herd on the Glomar Explorer. And I did that, and that got program ended. Then he got hired by Lockheed and their helicopters. And he was in that for a while, and then they invited him to come over to the Skunk Works. And he ran the Half Blue, which is the little prototype of the F-117, and then he ran the F-117 program. And then retired as Vice President and General Manager of the Skunk Works in 1985. They had a hell of a career. All the time he lived up here on PV North, <laughs> commuted, <laughs> commuted to Burbank all those times. And he's just a hell of a guy. Now, we're gonna try and run a video of our little Doak 16 airplane.
maximum speed we we did it we pulled the props pulled the fans and set a little more pitch in and i think we got it up to about uh 200 miles an hour well the problem those those ducks were optimized for static thrust and we didn't get enough thrust and an awful lot of drag uh, the airplane was a great air show airplane but as a practical airplane zero uh, the price you pay if you can imagine taking a five thousand a three thousand pound airplane put 825 horsepower you can get it off the ground in a really short spot jimmy Riker did all our flying yeah and uh, the interesting thing about jimmy jimmy was a private pilot and he didn't have any flight test experience i don't think he had 300 hours maybe and uh, we wrote a spec for a test pilot. He had to have 5,000 5, hours in vertical takeoff airplanes. <laughs> and he couldn't weigh more than 90 pounds. <laughs> and uh, there just weren't many of those around. So we did what we could. And the Army sent him down to Fort Rucker, Alabama, and gave him a two-week course to uh, learn helicopters. And Jimmy came back, and he ran this airplane, and he did a magnificent job. Absolutely magnificent. The only two other pilots that flew the airplane were two NASA pilots, uh, Fred Drinkwater from Ames and uh, another fellow, I can't remember his name, from, uh, from Langley. We really wanted to, the guys at Ames to have the airplane because Fred could fly that airplane just as, bad, just as well as Jimmy. And uh, Jack Reeder was the fellow from uh, Langley. He had problems with it. Of course, he's the one that ended up flying it at, at uh, Langley. Uh, of course, I was always on the radio with Jimmy. He says, get that goddamn helicopter out of here. The guys took off in the helicopter and gave him a big batch of, rose, of rotor wash just as he's lifting off. And, and this was a still air airplane. Yeah. He says, get that son of a bitch out of here. I don't think I ever asked him that question. Did he wear a parachute? Uh, no. Yeah. We never flew it very well. We did when we were ferrying the airplane, when we had some altitude. No, and we didn't have an ejection seat. And uh, that was a major concern. But I think it was either 20 or 40 gallons. I can't remember. I know it wasn't very much. The airplane could fly with the ducks in any angle, anywhere from zero to 90 degrees. Uh, now he's coming in and you use the ducks, rotate them back, put a little power on it, and you've got dynamic braking. These are Cessna 182 brakes, and they're not designed for an 820 horsepower airplane. We couldn't hold the brakes at, at even just a little bit above flight idle. It was about all we could do. So he always rotated the ducks back. Now here's what, here was the surprise. I don't remember seeing this happen, and I watched this thing. When Jimmy went too far because he wanted to get to the right place for the camera for the next sequence, and he just backed it up. <laughs> no, you have one set of controls. Oh, the the veins in the duct, when it's vertical in flight, work, but as the duct angle changes, they fade it out so that when when the ducts were playing forward there was no change in the vein. It was some mechanical wizardry. But, no, but everything was very simple. Basic airplane. It had a throttle for up and had a little vernier on the throttle so you could trim the thrust at, at low speed. No, I mean at uh, hover. The question is are there one around? There's one in the original. They only built one of them. It's in a muse Army Transportation Museum at Fort Eustis, Virginia. It was the Doak 16 was the, the company number and the Army designation was Army designation of the airplane was VZ, Victor Zebra, for DA, for Doak Aircraft. Was there a VZ-1 or 6? Yeah, we had a, a yeah, there was. A VZ-1 was a, was a guy standing on a platform, on a ducted fan. Okay. <laughs> one of those. And the other, the, the, the other one was a flying Jeep, two-holer, I think. The problem is with ducted fans, they're great for static thrust. But in order to get cruise performance or high-speed performance, you play a horrible drag penalty. And it's just... Uh, it's just, it just isn't a good way to do it. <laughs> I don't think there is a good way to do it. I think you should have airplanes and you should have helicopters and nothing in between. <laughs> they're, they're still going back to the ducted fans for vertical takeoff right now. Yeah. 
projects. Oh, I know. I know. Gills that doesn't mean it's a good idea. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, that completes my portion of the presentation. I'd like to turn it over to my friend here. And he's the guy, Don is the guy that got me started in this thing. I got an email from him. I had posted something on a, on a website and I got an email from him showing interest in Doak. And so we, this is the first time we've actually met. Uh, we've emailed back and forth for the last year or so. But uh, anyway, it's all yours. Thank you, Ray, for the excellent introduction. And uh, I will be covering uh, the life and times of Edmund Doak on part two of the TV program. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.